Hello, everyone. Some of you know me in different capacities. Uh, many of you know me from my medical career. Uh, I first came to prominence doing hemispherectomies, an operation in children with intractable seizures where we actually remove half of the brain. And uh, it had been something that had been done in the past, but had fallen out of favor because of the high morbidity and mortality. And we figured out ways to do it without that happening. And that brought a lot of attention. And then the next 15 minutes of fame came with operating on babies while still in the mother's womb. And the next 15 minutes of fame came with separating conjoined twins. And the 15 minutes kept coming after that. But, you know, after a long uh, medical career, 36 years at Johns Hopkins, uh, I decided to retire. And some people say, why did you retire? Well, someone had told me that neurosurgeons die early, and I didn't believe that. So I wrote down the name of the last 10 neurosurgeons that I knew who died, calculated the average age of death, and believe it or not, it was 61. And I said, whoa. So I said, I think if I'm still alive when I turn 61, I'm going to retire. And I did. But then I failed retirement. Because after I gave the National Prayer Breakfast uh, keynote address in 2013, everybody was saying, you should run for president, which I thought was the most ridiculous ideal in the history of the world. I said, if I just ignore these people, they'll go away. But uh, they didn't go away. Every place I went, there were people with placards and run, Ben, run. I had over 500,000 petitions in my office. I could barely get in there. It was ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I finally said, Lord, if you really want me to run, you got to give me all the stuff that someone who runs for president has. And that would be, first of all, uh, money, a Rolodex with all the important contacts, a staff, an organization. Next thing I knew, all of those things were there. We were raising more money than the RNC each month. It was ridiculous. And, uh, but that was when I really got a good dose of common sense. As I was traveling around this country campaigning and listening to the concerns of average Americans in every setting and realizing how much we have in common and how much common sense exists out there and how divorced it is from some of our policymakers. Many of our policymakers have common sense when they start but somehow they get into the system and they get tainted and other things begin to attract their attention. And uh, all of a sudden they lose sight of why it is that they're there. They're there to be our representatives. We have a democratic republic type of government, which means we have representatives. And the government is supposed to work for the people not the people for the government. All of these things became increasingly apparent to me as I encountered and interacted with all kinds of Americans. But when I hit front runner status out of the 17 people who were running, boy, was I in for a rude awakening at that point. The lies just started coming out of the wall. It was ridiculous. And... Um, at the end, there were only five of us left, and I decided to drop out and support the person whose philosophies were closest to mine. That happened to be Donald Trump. We have very similar philosophies, but very different personalities, as you might have ascertained. Um, but I didn't want to see a brokered convention because I thought that would have been a disaster uh, for conservative causes. And we would have ended up with uh, someone who would appoint three uh, very left-wing Supreme Court justices, and on and on it would have gone. But after, uh, after that, I ended up as the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, which is the, the agency that I wanted because I had grown up in poverty and I'd seen the deleterious effect of dependency on people and wanted to do something about that. And uh, we had a chance to do a lot of fantastic things, and we'll have a chance to talk about some of those 
uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, after the election in 2020, I said, now, this time, I really can retire. But uh, after a few weeks seeing the direction of things, uh, recognizing that maybe we weren't using a lot of common sense in the way that we were doing things, that maybe I wouldn't be able to enjoy myself on the golf course or cruising around the world. So some very uh, talented people from HUD, along with myself, decided to create the American Cornerstone Institute, looking at the cornerstone principles that made our country great. You know, our country did not become great by coincidence. It was because there were values and principles that we practiced, like our faith, which taught us how to relate to each other to love your neighbor, not to cancel your neighbor. And the, the cornerstone uh, that is so important is liberty. People came to this nation from all over the globe because they wanted to be free. They wanted to be able to live as they wanted, utilize their talents and skills, their entrepreneurial uh, talents, their innovation to benefit themselves, their families, their communities, and their nation without a dictatorial source mandating things for them. That was the promise of America. And we know that we need to refocus on that. And then the cornerstone of community. So many different skills and talents, people being able to work together. There were just... This dotted all over this nation, small communities, 20 families, 50, 100 families, different skills and talents, but able to work together to coalesce, to create synergy, and to grow. And we became extraordinarily powerful because of that. And then the cornerstone of life, our appreciation of life, from the womb to the tomb, for quality of life. And as we've grown more callous with respect to life, we've become more distant from each other. And those are things that we very much want to change. Those are things that we will be talking about with a lot of different kinds of people. And, you know, bear in mind that America was established as an experiment. No one in Europe actually thought it would work. You can't have a nation that is of, by, and for the people. You have to have an overarching king, a monarch, some kind of direct authority. People cannot govern themselves. That's what they thought. And yet, that experiment worked for 250 years there's some threat to it now. There's no question that COVID has shown us that our governmental officials can be very authoritative and uh, mandating all kinds of things without a good basis as well. But these are some of the things that we will talk about. And, uh, you know, we are not here to tear down anyone or destroy anyone. All of our guests will be treated with a tremendous amount of deference and respect. We, we believe in doing that, and there's, there's nothing to be gained by tearing other people down. But we will be honest, and we will ask people for the basis of their beliefs and for the evidence of what they believe. And we will always share the evidence with you of the things that we believe. And we will explore why did Ronald Reagan say that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction, that it must be fought for, that it must be protected. And we'll look for ways that each of us in our spheres of influence can fight for it, ways that we can protect it, ways that we can emphasize our faith, liberty, community, and life. 
and how we can maintain the greatness of this nation. We'll be sharing stories and insights and discussions with you as we explore all of these principles. We'll be taking a deep dive into the kind of issues that we face every single day as Americans. And I hope it will cause you to think about what's important. What makes America so desirable? You know, I find it fascinating that there are those in our society who try to denigrate our nation. And they try to make you think that we're especially evil, that there's something unique about the slavery that occurred in our nation that makes us evil. But of course, anybody who knows anything about history knows that it wasn't unique that we had slavery. Virtually everybody had it. But we are unique in one, spe one aspect, and that is we had so many people who thought it was abominable, that it was antithetical to our founding principles, that they were willing to fight a civil war and lose a large portion of our population to rid ourselves of an evil institution. And that was truly unique in the world. And that is something that we should be teaching our children. That when we see evil, sometimes we can't just turn our back. We can't just put our head down. We can't just close our eyes and act like it doesn't exist. Sometimes there are very substantial sacrifices that have to be put forth in order to rid ourselves of that evil. This podcast is going to be an interactive experience. We're going to want to hear from you. We're going to want you to be involved. And we'll have very interesting guests uh, week after week. And I think it'll be something that you're going to be looking forward to. And we're going to want you to get your friends involved, get your family involved. Because what we have to do is bring common sense back to America. That common sense will tell us that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. And we have to stop falling for that foolishness, for those people who are trying to pit us against each other on the basis of race, religion, income, age, political affiliation, gender, you name it, driving wedges between us to try to control us in order to give themselves the power. If we're truly smart, if we truly use these massive brains that God gave us, we won't fall for it. You know, interestingly, if you th think about the human brain, it is a fascinating organ system. Billions and billions of neurons Hundreds of billions of interconnections can process more than two million bits of information in one second. It is incredible. And yet, there are those who don't want us to use it. For instance, the proponents of critical race theory, which, of course, they say it doesn't exist. There's no critical race theory. We don't teach that in school. You can call it what you want. But when you're trying to teach our children that the most important factor, the most important determinant of what happens in their lives is the color of their skin, you are not doing them a service and you're not teaching them to use their brain. You know, animals, animals, have very well-developed parts of their brain for reacting, like the midbrain. Theirs are much better developed than our midbrains. But our frontal lobes, 
which are used for rational thought processing, are, are much better. Much better than with animals. We can extract information from the past, integrate it with information from the present, project it into the future, which means we can plan, we can strategize, we can plan a year ahead, five years ahead, ten years ahead. Think about that. Animals can't do that. And yet we have people who are trying to teach our children to act like animals, to react to what they see, like the color of a person's skin, and not to use those frontal lobes to analyze the content of their character. Isn't that what Dr. Martin Luther King meant when he said he dreamed of a time when we would judge people by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, when we would act like intelligent, rational human beings and not like animals. Think about it. There are those who want us to go backward. We need to be going forward in our relationships. And think how much we can get done if we work together, if we stop hating on each other, if we understand that we don't have to be enemies because we have different opinions. Yes, take, for example, energy. There are those who believe in the Green New Deal. Only green energy, only renewable energy. There are those who say our fossil fuels are one of the greatest blessings that God ever gave us. Could they both have some validity in what they think? Do they have to be enemies? Why can't we use the tremendous natural resources that we have, which we've learned how to extract and utilize in a clean way, the cleanest energy that we've ever had, the cleanest air and water since we've been doing measurements, energy independence, net exportation of energy, which was a tremendous boost to our economy. Why can't we have that and explore green energy, renewable energy at the same time? The fact of the matter is we would get there much faster if we use what we have already as a platform to get what we want and we then substitute as it becomes feasible economically. That's what smart people do. That's what people who use those big frontal lobes do. People who just react say, I don't want to do this because they did that. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And we can do so much better. And that, that goes for almost all of the different things that we're experiencing as a society today. Let's just think about our children. Think about the responsibility that we have to them and how we should model intelligent action and compassionate action for them. And, you know, when it comes to our children, I think about what's going on right now in Florida, where the governor uh, is advocating that we do not teach kindergarten to third graders complex issues about gender. That makes a lot of sense. That's just common sense. Just like you don't teach first, second, and third graders calculus. You know, they've just learned how to add and subtract. They're not ready for differential equations yet. You have to lay the foundation. And at the appropriate time, you do that. Just because you think of it, you say, oh, calculus. Yeah, let's teach them calculus. Just because you've thought of it, that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do at that time. That's 
why you use your brain. And we will give those who think that you should be teaching them, uh, you know, about complex gender issues at a young age, we will give them a chance to explain why they think that, and we can see if it makes any sense to you. It doesn't make any sense to me, <laughs> but maybe they'll have some great insight that uh, they just have been holding back, and they want to surprise us with it. Well, we'll give them that opportunity, and we'll give you an opportunity to comment on it as well. But the bottom line is, you know, we want to do the things that are good for us as a society. We want to talk about the things that are good for us as a society, the things that will allow this nation uh, to continue on an upward pathway, an upward trajectory, things that will allow this nation to be an example to the rest of the world, not a nation that tries to follow everyone else, but a nation that leads. And think about how the world was before the United States became a great nation where you had the despotic leaders just trampling on anyone who was weaker than they are, destroying them, pillaging, raping. And when this became the predominant nation in the world, through example, we showed that that's not the way to do things. And through the use of our military might, we encouraged those despots to lay down their weapons and not to take advantage of others. But as we are becoming weaker, and we are, you see those despotic leaders starting to rise up again. And we're going to see total chaos if we don't regain control. And we have to do that. And it's part of that faith foundation things, doing things that are right, doing things that are fair, that led us to be that kind of a nation. We were the first pinnacle nation that didn't try to dominate everybody else, to try to take their land and to uh, dominate their people. And that is, again, something that is quite unique, something of which we should be proud and something that we need to continue. But these are the kinds of things that we want to talk about. We want to talk about those things with you every single week. We'll be back shortly. And we're back with more common sense for you. You know, I think about where did common sense come from for me? And I have to say it, it came from my mother. My mother came from a huge rural family. And, uh, you know, back in those days, it was not uncommon to have more than a dozen children. Uh, her count was closer to two dozen. But she got married when she was 13 years old, trying to escape dire poverty in rural Tennessee. She had less than a third grade education. And yet, I will tell you, she was the wisest person that I ever met. Um, my father, not so much. He was much, much older than she was. And uh, they moved from Tennessee to Detroit. He was a factory worker. Uh, she discovered some years later that he was a bigamist. So obviously uh, that resulted in a divorce. But before uh, their divorce... She saved every penny, every extra penny, and bought property. And at one point, they owned a significant amount of property in Detroit before my father gambled it all away. And if he had had the good sense to listen to my mother with her less than third grade education, I would have been born under very different circumstances. And it just goes to show you that wisdom and common sense is not necessarily something that you get at school. It comes from God. 
There are a lot of extremely wise people who've never had much in the way of formal education, and yet they just seem to, to have a sense of right and wrong, a sense of what will work and what does not work. You know, uh, and I think, and I thank God for it, that I had a sense of that in my medical career. Uh, there were a lot of situations that I encountered uh, that were unique. And, you know, I would pray and ask God to give me wisdom in terms of how to handle that. But some things were just basic. For instance, if you were doing an opening and you cut the skin and it was difficult to control the bleeding and it kept oozing even after you used traditional methods, then common sense would say, maybe you better check the coagulation status of that patient before you take off the bone flap and open the dura and get into the brain substance. Because if you're having trouble controlling the bleeding at the skin edge, it might be much worse when you get into the brain. You know, that's what I call common sense. I've seen some people who don't have that, and uh, they get in a lot of trouble. Some of them get in trouble in the operating rooms. Some of them get in trouble on the streets. Uh, there are lots of situations in which when you don't think things through, uh, you have a problem. And, you know, we need to be cognizant of the fact that because one person who belongs to a particular group does something that doesn't make sense, you can't really ascribe that kind of behavior to the whole group. And of course, I'm referring specifically to police officers. You know, remember in the case of George Floyd, you know, we had an officer who was way off the beaten path in terms of common sense, in terms of the way he handled, uh, you know, that individual. It doesn't matter what that individual had done. You know, to put the individual down on the ground, handcuffed with your knee on his neck, restricting his breathing. Uh, I mean, give me a break. That makes sense in nobody's book. And of course, you saw nobody trying to defend that uh, type of action. However, look at what it engendered. You had all kind of people coming out and trying to say that this thing is an example of what happens every day all across America. And of course it doesn't. I mean, this is, this is way off on the end of the bell curve in terms of uh, police behavior. And yet, as a result of that, riots all over the country, and even in other countries, uh, because of the way that uh, the media and some others portrayed this and tried to exploit the situation. And it's still having ramifications even today. You look at uh, how many places are calling for, you know, decreasing the influence of the police because of that one extremely unstable police officer who, in fact, uh, did receive justice. So common sense tells us that we need to go back and, and re-examine that situation, re-examine our reaction to it, and re-examine the role of police, and look at the data, and see if decreasing and defunding the police has resulted in a better situation anywhere. Or has it created more chaos? And that's one of the things that we will emphasize very strongly in this podcast. Evidence. Data. Let's look at the facts. And again, that's the reason that we have these very complex brains that can extract information from the past, integrate it with information from the present, project it into the future wise decisions.
running things the way that they should be run by intelligent human beings. Back in a moment. And we're back with more common sense. You know, I think about one of the things that disturbed me so much when I was growing up, and that was poverty. I just hated being poor. You know, I just fantasized about what would it be to be middle class and not to have to worry about every penny, every dime. I remember we used to sometimes have popcorn balls at school. The teacher would tell you the day before, bring a nickel tomorrow because we're going to have popcorn balls. Some kids could bring a quarter. Some even brought a dollar, bought a whole bag of popcorn balls. I never had a popcorn ball. Never had an extra nickel. And those popcorn balls look so good. I I just fantasized about it. But I would act like I didn't want one. I'd say, who wants that? I really wanted it more than anything, but I didn't want anybody to know that I wanted it and couldn't afford a popcorn ball. But my mother made us read books, and I didn't want to read those books. I wanted to watch TV. I wanted to go outside and play. I wanted to have fun. But she would have none of it. We had to read the books. And as I started reading about people of great accomplishment, all kinds of people in all kinds of fields, I began to understand something so important. And that is that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. You actually get to decide. You get to decide whether you're going to be a victim Or are you going to take advantage of all the things that exist around you? I hadn't been taking advantage of all the things until I really grasped that concept. You know, the high school that I was going to in inner city Detroit was not known for academic performance, (laughs) and that's putting it mildly. Um, And there weren't a lot of opportunities in that particular school. But I began to discover that there were opportunities in other places. I began going downtown to Wayne State University and utilizing a lot of the libraries that were there. I got involved as a science lab assistant at Wayne State University, learned a lot of things there spent a lot of times at the Detroit Institute of Arts, one of the premier art galleries in the nation. Soon I knew all the paintings in there, who painted them when they were born, when they died. Began to listen to other types of music other than just the Motown sound. Uh, Got to the point where I could identify most of the common classical musical pieces with just a few measures of hearing the music. And it just really opened up a whole new world for me, a whole new world that told me that I didn't have to limit myself to what other people thought I should be doing. I didn't have to listen to those who were saying that the system was stacked against you, that you could not achieve, that you might as well just give up and be resentful. I didn't listen to any of that stuff anymore, nor would my mother allow me to listen to it. She never accepted an excuse. It didn't matter what it was. She would say, do you have a brain? And if the answer to that question was yes, then she said, well, it doesn't matter what John or Mary or or Daniel or Rebecca said or did, because you could have thought your way out of it. You don't have to do what they do. You don't have to follow their example. And that's why you have this incredible brain. And I think 
that that's probably why I got involved in doing things in my medical career that maybe some others hadn't done before. And it's okay, because you develop a different kind of mindset. And when people say to me, no one's ever done that before, that doesn't stop me. No one's ever done anything until somebody does it. So that that just gives you motivation to move further and to move faster in a direction that you want to go. And I want us in America to once again get that can-do attitude, not the what-can-you-do-for-me attitude, which has become more prevalent, which is one of the reasons that we have trouble finding workers. And is it any surprise that some people have discovered that there are ways to get money from the government without working? So why would they want to work? Well, I'll tell you why they should want to work. Because when you work, you gain skills. You gain knowledge. You gain opportunities. Opportunities to climb the ladder even further, even higher, rather than just to be stationary and to be satisfied. So these are the kinds of messages that we need to get out to our people. And also recognize that how long can you have a government that sustains the people? And it's really not sustaining the people because it's doing unborrowed money and just driving up our national debt, which we pass on to our children, our grandchildren, and decrease the quality of their lives. These are things that we will be talking about, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Common Sense, the last segment of this program this week, but we'll be back next week once again talking about those aspects of common sense that help us to succeed as a society. We're going to continue to be talking about them every week, talking about your faith. And I can't tell you how much that means to me my faith. You know, our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain unalienable rights given to us by our Creator, a.k.a. God. And if our rights are given to us by God, then our rights are protected by God, and cannot be taken away from us by government. And that's why our Constitution is written the way it is written, to prevent government from trying to take our rights away. What you have to recognize is something that our founders understood so clearly. And I have to give our founders a lot of credit. They did a very in-depth study of governments from the beginning of time until their time to try to take the best elements and exclude the bad things. And one of the things that they recognized is that it didn't matter what kind of government it was. There was going to be a tendency for it to grow to infiltrate, and to dominate the people. Because that's a a natural part of what governments do automatically, just by nature. And they wanted to give the people the knowledge and the tools to control and constrain the government. So the government is not bad. And I don't want anybody to think that we believe that our government is evil. Our government is a government, and it does what governments do. And it is our responsibility to control the government, to constrain it, just like you would 
a horse, a wild horse. You, you train it, and then you get that horsepower, and you go a lot further and a lot faster. But it has to be constrained in the appropriate way. And then that liberty. We cannot in any way relax on the issue of our liberty. That statue that sits in New York Harbor should remind us how precious liberty is. It's what gives us the American dream. Does any other country have a dream? I don't think so. I think Canada thought they had one until a few weeks ago. They saw that they didn't have what they thought they had. But we have it, and we cannot let it go. And we have to fiercely protect, not just speech. And I certainly hope that Elon Musk is successful in what he's trying to do with Twitter. We'll be talking about that in the weeks to come. Because when we reach a point where people in America are afraid to express themselves because they might lose their job or because their families might be affected in a negative way, then we are in severe jeopardy and danger of losing that freedom. Some people say, well, we have freedom of speech. The government hasn't stopped us from, from speaking our mind. Let me tell you, if big tech and the media can punish you with the compliance of the federal government, it is exactly the same as if the federal government is doing it. Don't be fooled. And we'll be delving into those kinds of issues. And then we really want to spend a lot of time talking about community, who we are as Americans, and how we should not be fighting each other, but helping each other. And I want you to, to try this until our next meeting. I want you to try to be nice to somebody in your community that you normally ignore. You just walk by them and act like they don't exist. Give it a try. I think you're going to find it is really, really cool when you do that. It's a lot of fun. And it's a lot easier to be nice to people than it is to be mean to people. And remember, the people you meet on the way up are the same ones you meet on the way down. So you'd be very glad on the way down that you were nice to them. And then life. The precious life of all of our fellow citizens. And we need to look at them with compassion. When you see that drug addict out there on the street, don't look down your nose at them. Recognize that they got into a bad situation. Most addicts, if they could push a button and they wouldn't be addicted any longer, they would wear that button out. They might not admit that to you, but they would. And we need to be thinking about ways that we can improve their lives. We need to be thinking about those babies in the womb. There are those who want you to believe that there are mothers who have a right to destroy that baby. The closest relationship there is, the mother and that child, and that child is in that mother's womb because that's the most protected place it can be, and we have people trying to make them into enemies. Does that make any sense at all? We will be talking about that in the weeks to come. We look forward to you joining us, and we would ask that you would get everyone you know to join us too as we bring America back to a place of common sense.